It's the 15th of September, 2015, and this is episode 247. This show is intended for informational and educational purposes only. Cryptocurrency is new, empowering, and exciting, but we're not experts, just obsessed companions walking the road towards a more peer-to-peer future. Welcome to Let's Talk Bitcoin. This is Matthew Zipkin, and today on the show, we're joined by Makoto Takamiya, Jeff McDonald, and Long Wong, and they are joining me from Tokyo, Korea, and Malaysia, respectively. They are the developers and the core team behind the new economy movement. How's it going, guys? Good. Yeah. Hi, thank you. Makoto, I believe you're the founder of the new economy movement. Why don't you tell us your motivations for putting your time into this project? Well, I don't know if I could be called the founder, but I'm one of the core devs who's been on the team since the beginning. And really, I think the big motivation for starting the project was to create a new platform from scratch that was a lot more solid and easier to use and uh, that people could use to control their finances in a safe way and rectify some of the problems with the existing platforms. And by existing platforms, you're referring to Bitcoin? Well, yeah. Coins like Bitcoin and Next and similar projects like that. There's literally hundreds of projects out there. Okay. And is NEM a fork of Next? No, it's a new coin that's developed from scratch. Well, it's not really a coin, it's a platform. Okay, cool. So you guys have written a code base from scratch. It's all new. Yeah, we've been in development since January of last year. So it's been about one year and eight months or so. Why don't you tell us some of the features of NEM that are different from Bitcoin? The whole architecture is very different from Bitcoin. So for example, in Bitcoin D, kind of merges the client and the server together in the Bitcoin core application that everyone runs. What we did was we just completely separate the two by creating two different projects at the beginning. One is the dedicated server and the other is the dedicated client. And all the cryptographic lining of transactions can be done on the client side. So that way you don't even have to run your own server if you didn't want to. So if you're running a mobile app, you can't run a server on your on your iPhone. So you can just connect to a remote server safely and you can send transactions there. This is not impossible to do with Bitcoin, but it would be much harder because of the way the code base is currently designed. Interesting. So you've started from the ground up with two different programs, basically, two different applications. Yes. One of our uh, core devs has a lot of experience with doing web development and uh, that type of application. And so he wanted to, from the beginning, split up to two different projects. So we have NIS and NCC currently. NIS is the NEM infrastructure server, and that's what makes all the peer syncing and blockchain magic happen. And NCC is the community client, and we hope to have other clients in the future made by other people and then also mobile applications. And how do these two applications, how do they relate to, you know, a full node and SPV wallet uh, that we have in Bitcoin? Yeah, so SPV is kind of a similar idea in a way. There are some differences, but it's a similar idea. And then the full node would be, of course, the NIS because NIS stores all the blockchain data. Well, SPV is a prune blockchain versus what we have, which is a full blockchain. So that's the uh, fundamental difference between SPV and us. Okay, so the community client still downloads all the blockchain headers, though, to, to, to stay trustless? No, the community client actually works with the network infrastructure server. And the network infrastructure server is where we have our full blockchain. So the community client is basically a very thin client. It's a web architecture, so the two servers can talk to each other via JSON interface. And so the community client gets all the data from the server. So if you run your own server, you can trust it. If you use a random server on the internet, you likely can trust it because they don't have access to private keys. They can't steal money from you. But if you care about getting correct data, all the data, then you really want to run your own server. But for casual use, it's not that important, I think. Okay, yeah, I see. But does the community client still verify block headers or or can it be completely fooled? The community client doesn't do any transaction verification currently. If that's desired for some reason, then it's possible to modify a client or create a new client that does full verification of uh, the data that it displays. However, because none of the account's private keys are given to the remote server, It's not really a huge problem because no one can steal your money. All they can do is just show you wrong information. If you really care about being secure, you should run your own server anyway. 
So let's talk about the really interesting thing behind the new economy movement is the proof of importance model. Before we get totally into that, why don't you just sort of explain how proof of stake works, and then we can go from there to talk about what improvements you guys have done to proof of stake to create this thing called proof of importance. Okay, well, there are many implementations of proof of stake, but I think the best archetypal implementation is in Next currently. What Next does is you have the difficulty calculation, and then for each account, the stake that the account has is used to kind of give a, a weight along with a random number. The random number, I don't know what Next uses, but it's probably something like a public key that's verifiable by everyone. So you have a random drawing of the accounts using a random number, and then you also have a little bit of a bonus given the stake. And that allows people with a higher stake to have a higher probability of uh, creating a block. And every second that passes, the difficulty is dropped slightly, right? To, to that eventually somebody will find a block. In them, we have a peer to peer time service. And so we're able to do a good calculation of the time. And so each second that passes, the difficulty changes. And so you can create a block eventually. So probabilistically, even if very few people are running nodes and creating blocks, the difficulty will be set from the prior block such that it'll take about 60 seconds to create a new block for them. Other coins have different. Okay, cool. So you got a 60 second target block time. So that's interesting. You implemented your own time server in the network. I don't know of any other cryptocurrency that's done that. Why did you guys find that necessary? And, uh, and how's it work? <laughs> that's a big topic in itself. But um, let me talk about some of the reasons why it's necessary in order to have a good block time that's 60 seconds with very little variance, you need to have some kind of access to time service so that you can control the block difficulty. And also, there's security features too. So we actually timestamp uh, transactions and not just blocks. And so because you have times associated with transactions, doing attacks like double spends is much harder. And so those are some of the reasons why you would want a peer-to-peer -peer time service. And the way we did it is that each node has its own time and it samples randomly from its peers. And there's a little bit of a weighting based on the importance scores. Each peer or each node calculates the time is based on the sample. So it does a whole bunch of samples and then it, it does this in several rounds. And each round it can only change by a maximum of a given amount of time so that no bad node can come and, and quickly change the time in the network. If any of the peers give a time that's outside of an expected time frame, so for example, greater than one second, different from what you think the time is, then you just ignore them. And then we also do alpha trimming so that uh, outliers are removed and the network just converges. Each node independently calculates the time, but it converges to kind of a synchronized time by doing this. Does that take into account, you know, network lag? Yes, the model takes into account communication time between the local and partner nodes. So it does a request and response round. Okay, that's good. So here's my question then. If all the nodes in the network are synced with time and you're time stamping transactions, that seems like it's good enough to prevent double spends on its own. Why would you need a blockchain? Well, the time is, uh, you know, each peer c calculates its own time. So there is some variance, but the variance is uh, it's not too high. I think it's only within a few seconds. Once everything converges, I think it will converge to that, to something very close, so around 300 milliseconds. But even that is still probably not good enough resolution to do anything real on its own. But if you did have a uh, really good time service that you could rely on, uh, perhaps from a centralized authority, then yeah, you, you don't need to have uh, maybe some of the more complicated uh, blockchain parts. Well, I see, but, but you guys are obviously working on a decentralized project that doesn't want to rely on any kind of third party time server. So the timing synchronicity isn't totally security money critical. It just it helps the network work. Yeah. And we also use it uh, to kind of converge our block time to the desired 60 seconds. And from a user end perspective, I really like it because when I first started with cryptocurrencies, I would look at blockchain explorers from different platforms and sometimes the blocks there would be a block that came after another one but it would have a earlier time stamp because different machines were stamping upon their local time not using one unified time now most most uh computers are kind of synced up to the internet and they use their own time 
but sometimes different computers can have different times, which leads to kind of off timestamps sometimes on the block. With, with NIM, we're going to get a unified block time so that it's guaranteed when you look at an explorer, every block will have a timestamp after the block before it. Okay, right before we go into the proof of importance, just a, questions about proof of stake as it relates to Bitcoin and Bitcoin's proof of work. Obviously, proof of stake takes half of a percent of as much electricity, but there's been research into possible attacks like the nothing at stake attack. Would you guys talk about how you're addressing the vulnerabilities in a, in a proof of stake model? Okay, so the thing of state attack is probably the best criticism currently of proof of stake. And uh, I'll just summarize it now because it's not really well understood. I'll just start with Bitcoin. In Bitcoin, if you want to mine multiple forks, you actually have to run, you know, your mining equipment, different forks, and then try to create blocks at each fork. And you can only really do this for one fork at a time because you actually have to commit a real resource like electrical energy or, or time. And so you can't simultaneously mine multiple forks of the chain. In a proof of stake, because it's all done from sampling along a probability distribution, you can easily mine multiple forks at the same time if you wanted to. Uh, so the nothing at stake attack is everyone wants to create as many blocks as they can so that they can create transaction fees. They don't care if the blocks are on the main fork or not or what the main fork is in the theory of the attack. And so everyone will contribute their stake to every fork all the time. And so that even if you don't have much of a stake yourself, you can get lots of people to come and join your fork very easily is the, the reasoning. The reasoning is because everyone will want as much money as possible and they want transaction fees. However, at the same time, if everyone did this, then the value of the currency would go to zero. And so the argument itself is not really logically uh, consistent because people want more money, so they do this thing and then at the end they don't have any money because their coin is worthless. So it's it's a theoretical attack, but I think practically it's very unrealistic. It would be um, like playing Russian roulette with a automatic uh, pistol. <laughs> You're guaranteed to lose. <laughs> uh, but so the idea behind that attack is you mine as many forks as possible and kind of look ahead so that you look for the fork in which your public key can also mine the next block and then you've got two blocks and then you, yeah, you look at all the possible forks after that block and just keep a chain going where you're basically the only miner. Well, I mean, you want other people to join in anyway. NEM addresses this a little bit. After six hours, uh, forks can no longer be resolved. So if any forks are deeper than six hours, it won't replace the current chain. So that's one security feature. In uh, coins, I think Bitcoin, you can go back to, to Genesis if you had a quantum supercomputer. Right. Well, I think there are checkpoints in the code, but you're basically right. If you were able to somehow make a bigger proof than the Bitcoin networks already developed over the past six years, you could theoretically rewrite the entire chain from block zero. Yeah. And so in them, we, we at least have the six hour limits so that any changes you can do can only be done within the six hours. And then also the difficulty is calculated every block. In Bitcoin, it's calculated every two weeks or so. But in them, every block has its own difficulty score. And uh, that's calculated such that the change from the prior block cannot be higher than 5%. So if you're mining on a private chain without many people joining in, or even if you have lots of people joining in, when you first start, you can only change 5% uh, per block. So it's going to take you a long time to change the difficulties that you can mine with uh, smaller amounts of the overall stake. So hopefully that combined with the six hour limit will make it impractical to do any major attack. But it's it's a really just a theoretical problem. In practice, I don't think nothing at stake is really an issue. People like the team at Ethereum have proposed, I don't know if they're the for, first people to propose, perhaps not, but uh, they're proposing uh, using a bond bonded system with a proof of stake. And, uh, and that's an interesting idea, I think. Um, so you, you put some kind of bond forward, and then uh, if you were to get caught contributing to multiple forks, you could lose the money is one way that you could do it. It's an interesting idea. I, think. I see, gotcha. And in them, if you're going to, or I believe you guys call it harvesting instead of mining, if you're going to harvest, then you put up some kind of bond and you can't spend that money while you're using it to mine blocks? Well, I mean, we theoretically could do that, yes. Like I said, it's not really a practical problem at this point. So it's not something that we're too worried about. As of right now, there's no bond in NIM at all. But 
coins are aged in over 30 days at 10% of the remaining coins that have not been uh, aged in. So even though there's not an official bond, there is a weight towards people not being able to move a lot of Zen into an account and then instantly be able to harvest or mine with it. I see. So once I receive some NEM coins, I have to wait until they sort of trickle into my proof of stake account over time and then i eventually have enough there that i can okay harvest blocks cool yeah because it's vested and it takes about 30 days okay so let's move on to kind of the gem of your platform which is the proof of importance what did you guys do with proof of stake to make this new consensus algorithm okay so i'll just talk a little bit about how it's done specifically so each round that you're trying to forge with has a hit and a target value. And the hit is a random number that's based on the, the generation hash of the previous block and your public key. And your public key is known by everyone, so everyone can verify it. And if the hit is less than the target, then you win and you can create this block. And the target is calculated based on the time since the last block in seconds, and then also a factor relating the importance of your account and then that's divided by the difficulty for the new block based on the block difficulty. So the higher the importance, the higher the target goes and your hit, if it's lower than the target, and then you can create a block. And so in proof of stake, the target is calculated with the stake of the account, the amount of money an account has, and we calculate with importance. And I'll explain what importance is in a little bit. The reason why we didn't use stake is because, well, there's there's actually two reasons. And the first reason is in proof of stake, people who have money just make more blocks and they make more money. Theoretically, it's not really a great model to base a new economy on. And so we want to try to think about something new that would be more equal for one thing. And there's another reason as well. And that's other than just creating new blocks, you can also use the importance score for other purposes. So for example, blockchain-based voting. You can use it to weight votes in order to prevent civil tax, and you can do things like this. And importance is a, kind of a metric. It's a heuristic value of the importance of an account's contribution to the overall economy. And so you're rewarding people who contribute more to the economy, and not just people who are rich. And so that's the theory behind proof of importance and why we with importance. And if you want, I can explain how proof of importance is calculated. So is importance is kind of like a score or is it like a token you can send and receive? No, it's it's a score that's calculated, but it's, it's zero sum. The importance for all accounts in the system sum to unity. So if you become more important, other pe people become less important and vice versa. Okay, so as a NEM user, I have like a percent or something. Yes, exactly. Okay, cool. So yeah, what kinds of things make you more or less important? Okay, so the word importance actually refers to graph theoretic importance, and that's from the transaction graph. So up until now, the transaction graph is extremely valuable data, but up until now, it's really been neglected by everyone. So companies like Google or Facebook, Twitter, they all use graph-based algorithms in order to do search and to do things like recommendations. But for some reason in crypto, everyone's really ignored the transaction graph and doing any kind of graph theoretic calculations based on it. So importance, one of the most interesting parts of the importance score is we actually take the tra transaction graph and we, we run an algorithm that's kind of a modified uh, version of PageRank and it finds just important nodes in the graph. Now, PageRank can be spammed and the algorithm we use is uh, also somewhat susceptible to link spanning, not as much as PageRank. So we also add in other factors as well. And one of them is the stake of an account. And this is the, it's a little bit hard to explain, but it's the weight stake that the account has because we have a vesting schedule. So it's a vested stake, but it's the net vested stake. So if you were to receive a whole bunch of money, and then you also were to send a lot of money, if you were to receive more money than you send, then the difference is actually subtracted from your vested stake in order to calculate your kind of net vested stake. So it's better to give than to receive with respect to importance. And also with respect to the, the page rank score, it's actually NCD aware because the specific algorithm, but it's not very well known. But that score gives an account a higher score if they receive Zem from many different accounts just based on graph theory. So you want to give 
a lot of Zem to other people, and then you also want to receive Zem from many accounts. So this will kind of make your account more interesting with respect to the transaction graph. And the transaction graph really is a representation, a quantitative representation of the economy. And there's one more feature, and that's clustering. We actually cluster the transaction graph using Scan++, which is an algorithm developed here in Japan at NTT. This algorithm scales pretty well for uh, large graphs, and it will find three types of nodes. It'll find nodes in a cluster, it'll find hubs, hubs which uh, span clusters, and it'll also found, find outliers, which are just nodes or accounts that are on their own. So the accounts that are outliers or hubs don't get a very high score, but if you're in a cluster, then you'll get a higher score. So you really want to interact with other accounts such that your account will be put into a cluster. And so the mapping of the network architecture can be done trustlessly and, you know, is part of the distributed consensus is like how well connected your node is? Yeah, so the transaction graph, all the transactions are known on the blockchain. And so the transaction graph is independently calculated by all the nodes and they get the exact same result. If it's calculated independently on any node that has a, the access to the full blockchain, they'll get the same uh, result for all the accounts. Okay, wait, are we talking about hubs and clusters and outliers? Are we talking about like uh, accounts in the blockchain sending money to each other? Or are we talking about actual nodes on the internet and how they're... No, they're accounts. I study a lot of graph theory here at school, and so I sometimes say the word node instead of account. But yes, there are accounts in the system and not internet nodes. Okay, cool. So part of your economic model then is actually to in sort of encourage money velocity. Exactly, yes. It encourages velocity of money. There's some people who say that's not a desideratum of a, of a good economic model, but I would say that you really want to have good velocity of money in order to have a healthy economy. But it's my opinion, really. I've mainly studied the economist uh, Herbert Simon. He was also a big AI researcher and did lots of applications in many fields like game theory and physics and all, all kinds of fields. He won the Nobel Prize in economics uh, in the 70s, I believe. He talked a lot about how markets are not really rational and that they can't be rational. That's why he got the Nobel Prize, because he kind of put forward the theory that uh, humans are bounded in their rationality. So neurons in the brain take a fair amount of time to actually activate, so a few hundred microseconds. And so if you have a big column with a uh, hundred uh, neurons that all interact with each other, it's going to take some time, maybe even a, a few milliseconds in order to process some data. Even if you had access to all the information in the world, a uh, human cannot, because of the physical time that's required by neurons activating, a human cannot calculate or process all the information that they, if, if, even if they had access to it. But in reality, no one actually has access to all information in the world. And so because of that, humans are bounded in their rationality and because markets are creative human actors, markets are also irrational. That doesn't mean that markets are bad or that they don't optimize, it's just that they're not optimal. There's a difference between optimizing and being optimal. And uh, you can approach optimality, but you can't have mathematical certainty of it. And I think a lot of the economic problems or changes in markets that we see are, are caused by that. So what I want to say here really is just that I think velocity of money is desired in an economic model because markets are not rational in, in the way that they are because they're made of uh, people who are bounded in their rationality. And so you want to have the markets to flow as freely as possible so that you can try to, I don't know, if you, if you consider transactions to be calculations in the economy, you want to do as many calculations as possible to approach some kind of optimality. But that's my um, uh, theory. <laughs> No, I see. So it, it's a sound theory. So you're saying that free markets are this great model, but they're imperfect because they're based on human behavior. And by subsidizing money velocity in your new economy, it's like a little bit of lubrication to kind of keep that model optimal to, to, to make it work a little better. Okay. But the thing about it is that it, it only really matters if you're actually harvesting, right? If you don't care about mining blocks, then... You also don't care because what the subsidy does is it it makes it easier for you to harvest a block. If you're just a user, you're not harvesting, then the subsidy doesn't really affect you at all, right? Yeah, so most users won't care at all about proof of importance or, or their importance score, I think. 
because they won't care about mining, or, or we call it harvesting. But uh, there are going to be other uses for the importance scores, and we're working on some right now. And one is going to be reputation. Really, for any kind of distributed commerce to be practically usable in the real world, you have to have reputation. So if you study Amazon or eBay or, or Yahoo Auctions, uh, the only reason that these websites work is that the dealers have reputation. And in the case of eBay, the buyers also have a reputation. And so that way, there's some kind of trust. Even if you don't know the person, you can do some kind of estimation based on the previous reviews. And you can see that person it probably won't scam me. And so you'll buy something from them. The way to do that is with reputation and the way to have reputation in a decentralized system such that it can't be scammed by uh, civil attackers is you have to weight all the ratings and you have to have some kind of finite quantity to weight the ratings with and we want to use importance scores for that so if you have a higher importance in the economy you can rate people with a higher weight kind of similar to an on-chain reputation system in a way and so importance really is a really really basic reputation system for nodes and we use that to actually create more advanced to bootstrap a more advanced uh, reputation system that uh, is based on reviews are you considering adding reputation as like a second score value or would it all still be rolled up into the importance value we want to do it as a separate value. It won't be used for mining blocks, but it will just be used for humans to see and to interact with. Today's episode of Let's Talk Bitcoin is brought to you by Tokenly, limitless tokens for a tokenless world, and KeepKey hardware wallets at getkeepkey.com. This song is called Your Secret Safe With Me by The New Time. I'll be back in a moment with today's magic word. Today's magic word is time. That's T-I-M-E. Time. You've got until the 22nd of September to visit letstalkbitcoin.com or the Let's Talk Bitcoin iOS app to enter it for your share of the listener rewards. Let's rejoin the conversation now. This greasing the free market with the subsidized money velocity, this is like this is the reason behind the new economy movement, if 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 I'm not mistaken, right? This is the thing that's motivating you guys to make this system. Well, I mean it's I I don't know if I would go that far. <laughs> really the motivation to make this system is to create a really simple and well, simple from a developer's point of view, uh, a really simple and solid uh, blockchain platform that can be used by anyone. The blockchains they can really change the world because they provide a, a secure way to distribute the distributedly uh, store data and to share data across many nodes in a very stable network. However, platforms like Next or Bitcoin are really hard to develop for. I don't know if you've ever written any code to process the Bitcoin blockchain, but it's, it's extremely painful and, uh, and not fun at all. And so we wanted to really make a really a faster, lighter weight, and uh, kind of a easier to develop for platform that also rectifies some of the problems of Bitcoin. So, for example, energy use. So instead of proof of work, is proof of importance, and then also multi-sig in Bitcoin is very hard to set up. It takes at least a day of banging your head against the wall, and uh, and you have to use a special wallet, and it's very difficult. And then we have a blockchain-based multi-sig that's it's kind of a smart contract in a way. So our multi-sig 
is actually m of n. So you can create an account, and in, with one command, you can create your, you can turn your account into a multi-sig account, and you can add signatories to it. And it takes literally like 10 seconds to set up. It's really a beautiful system, and it's uh, probably one of the reasons why we haven't had any major hacks uh, or losses of money so far in them. Okay, yeah, let's talk about how the, the on-chain multi-sig system works, because I think that's a pretty compelling feature. Yeah, there's a lot of, I don't know, misunderstanding about uh, how that works, so I'll try to go through it. Basically, in them, there's many different transaction types, and we have docs that... Uh, it, it's a developer website, bob.nem.ninja slash docs. And uh, he, at that site, all the uh, transaction types are uh, explained. The multi-sigs and this, the signatory for a multi-sig account are not metadata with the account. They're actually the, on the blockchain. So to create a multi-sig account, you create a new transaction on the blockchain. It's, it's stored in the blocks and it's, it's provable with the signature of the person who created the transaction. So you can turn your account into a multi-sig account right on the blockchain with a special transaction type, and then you can add and remove signatories sub subsequently uh, using special transactions at any time. The signatories on the multi-sig account are just as secure as the balance of the account because they're just they're transactions in the blockchain. They're just a different transaction type. So that's basically how we do it. And we allow you to do M of M multi-sig and M of N. So M of M would be like 5 of 5. So to create a transaction on the blockchain, you have to have all five signatories sign off on the transaction. And there's a time limit that a person can set to do it. So within 24 hours or, or whatever. Okay, so before on-chain multi-sig is valid, every, all the participants need to sign and approve that transaction. Yes, for a trans transfer transaction, everyone has to sign it. Okay, and, and what actually advantages does this have over creating a multi-sig address off chain and then just sending money to it compared to the Bitcoin model where you and me just make up an address, you know, off off chain. Uh, there's many advantages. So one is ease of use. And uh, I, th I think Lon probably has some ideas. So maybe I'll let him talk. The other one is centralization of the signatories, whereby the signatories will have to sign on the central wallet as opposed to what we have at NEM where we do not need to communicate with the central wallet to actually sign the transaction. So that's, that's a very uh, big major difference in that sense. That is interesting. And then does everybody need to sign a transaction before it's valid in the chain? Or can the first person sign it and it gets mined and it's in the blockchain, but the money isn't actually moved until the other two people also submit a separate transaction further down the line? No, the transactions are in a pending transaction cache. They're not put in any blocks until they actually get signed off by everyone. Okay, so you still sort of have to collaborate outside the blockchain with the other signatories. It's all done in NIS on the server. It's just done on peer-to-peer -peer networks. All the uh, peers will communicate to each other. And if it's not signed within the, the time limit, then the transactions just disappear. Okay. Do you guys have a Bitcoin style multi-sig implemented as well? Is there even such a thing or, or you haven't bothered because you got the on-chain model? We, we only have an on-chain model. Okay. So there's a few other, what other transaction types have you guys added to the blockchain? Is it just transferring money from one person to another or are there some new message types that you guys have also implemented? So the multi-sig account setup is one transaction type and then also sign signatory uh, changes. One other interesting one is importance transfer. We have an on-chain mapping of importance from one account to another. And uh, I'll explain why this is useful. If you have $10,000 worth of Zen, for instance, and you want to harvest blocks, uh, maybe even with multi-sig, <clears throat> maybe you don't want to uh, have that account online and uh, and harvesting in case your node got hacked or whatever. Uh, there's lots of reasons why you don't want your account to be online, actually. We allow what's called delegated harvesting. You push a button in our client that says start delegated harvesting, and that creates a special transaction on the blockchain. And uh, that transaction creates a mapping from your account to another account. So that other account can then harvest without any money uses your importance. And then that account can just collect the fees and the fees will actually be transferred back to the parent account, not to yours. So it's a it's a one to one mapping between one account and another remote account. Okay, but the person you send the importance to to do the mining on your behalf, they they get a percentage or what? No, they don't get anything. 
Oh, what's the incentive then? It's not for another person to use. It's for you to use for yourself for a security feature. In the future, if we actually have voting or something like that, it could something like that could be used for delegated democracy uh, on the blockchain. So that's that's one thing that we're thinking about. Also, on our uh, I don't know how much I should talk about it, but uh, on our testnet, we actually have uh, asset implementation. So assets are basically colored coins. We call them mosaics. So next. They're just called assets. And in Bitcoin, they're called color coins or whatever, because you actually take a Satoshi or whatever and you map data onto it. So I guess Counterparty is doing so, and Omni uh, are doing things like that. But in Next, you can actually create assets out of thin air. And, and we can do that in NEM now uh, too on our testnet. And uh, that's called uh, mosaics. And so those are special transaction types as, as well. Mosaics, we haven't really released too much information yet, uh, so this might be one of the first times that, that we've talked about it. Let's start with next. So if you create a asset called foo, that name is not unique. You can create a thousand foos and users will have a fun time ser searching for the correct foo all day by looking at the asset ID. That causes a lot of problems just with not being able to trust if an asset is really the correct asset or not or, or who created it. You don't. It's really hard to look up everything. However, on the internet, there's already a good way to link data to someone, and that's called domain names. If you go to a website, google.com, you know who that is. You know that's Google, and it's their homepage that they've registered. So we took that idea, and we created a on-blockchain domain name registration. We call them namespaces, and we allow up to three levels deep. So you can register a top-level domain, let's say Jeff, and then you can register a subdomain to that called foo, and then a subdomain uh, called bar under that. So you could have jeff.foo.bar, and that will be your namespace. And then under that, you can create assets. So you can create assets under any layer. So if you are Google, you could register the namespace Google, and then you could create asset name foo, and then Everyone who sees that will see the name google.foo. They'll know that this foo is, is, the, is the real foo that uh, Google created. So by linking assets to namespaces, we set the groundwork for reputation, and then we also make it a lot easier for people to, to not get scammed because uh, they are able to find that. And in the future, there's a lot of other things that you can do with namespaces as well. So for example, decentralized internet. Let's talk about the origin of our term mosaics. Nick Sabo talked a lot about property titles and representing ownership. We thought long and hard about how to implement this on the blockchain, and we added many ideas such as computation and reputation to go along with property titles. So we came up with the idea of property tiles, which we also called smart tiles, which later evolved to what we call uh, mosaics. Actually, Jeff has read, I think, every article written by Nick and he helped us come up with the concepts behind mosaics. Jeff, maybe you can explain more. Originally, or at one point a while back, Nick Sobo had made an article where he mentioned property tiles. And in that blog, he's talking about how he imagines on the blockchain there can be tiles that represent different things, like maybe car titles or IDs or any basically anything that you need to secure on the blockchain it could have a digital representation as a tile well when you combine different tiles in real life you can get a mosaic and so that's what we're thinking about in nim is not just having one tile on the blockchain but have, being able to have many tiles put together into packages or bags or collections and then you can have a collection of assets or tiles and send those off to different people. This is the reason why we settled on the name Mosaic for the tile or asset feature on the NIM blockchain. So do the different tokens, how do they fit together? Why, why do they need to be in a group? They don't have to be, but if a person would like to because it's to their advantage to group them, then they're, they're going to have that option. And the advantage would, would, would mainly be to back it by your reputation. Yes. That's one use. And then another use is we're actually looking at adding other features to each individual tile in Mosaic, so the assets in the Mosaic. So for example, smart contracts. You could have a distributed program that lives inside a Mosaic, and then to enable other Mosaics to use that, 
just add them together, you group them together. So we want people to be able to kind of modularly combine different things together and to be able to create more interesting things. Kind of like Legos is the analogy. In Legos, you have many different blocks that are very simple. You can combine them together to create really any arbitrary thing that you want. I see. So this is really so. What would be an example of that? Of of putting together a few tokens to create, you know, a mosaic. For example, if you had a a token that they're not just tokens, but uh, if you had a mosaic that was, for example, a storage contract. So storage and bandwidth and maybe CPU. So basically, a, a web server contract. Then you could have another token that is a distributed program. And so if you combine them together, you could actually create a, a program that runs on a distributed server. That's kind of the future goal of uh, what we want to do. Another uh, more simpler uh, use case would be if you create a, a physical coin, like for example, silver coin, and you want to link or give a face value to that coin of, let's say, 100 Zem. So you could actually link the two together. You have a silver coin asset, and then you have 100 Zem asset. And then you link the two together, and then that's a mosaic, and then you, you can send that around as a group to people. So it's kind of like giving physical coin to someone uh, on the blockchain in that the, uh, the values are linked. Cool. And when you bring the mosaic feature over to the mainnet, can you do that with, without a hard fork? Uh, no, it needs a hard fork, of course. In coins that are not proof of work, it's fairly easy to get uh, hard forks uh, approved, I think, because you don't have um, an anonymous miners controlling everything. So for proof of stake or proof of importance, the, the people who create blocks actually have a stake in the system. <laughs> so they want the system to succeed. Bitcoin mi miners want the system to succeed, but more than that, they also want low operational cost, and then they also want just lots of Bitcoin for themselves. And so they don't care as much about creating a robust system, I think. I see. I see. This is all very cool stuff so far. Are there any other uh, technical features that we didn't discuss yet? So right now in Bitcoin, one of the debates that, w that happened with XT was they tried to implement a new feature into XT where uh, Bitcoin nodes would have a security feature in case a node was sending bad information. In the NIM network, there is Eigentrust++, plus plus, which is going to give some kind of reputation to nodes to allow only good information to be, well, mostly good information. Mikado, can you explain it a little bit better? Yeah, we, we basically implemented Eigentrust++ plus plus to secure our peer-to-peer -peer network. It's actually a little bit simpler than the Eigentrust++ plus plus algorithm in the paper uh, because, well, I'll, I'll just explain what it is. When nodes communicate with each other, there are three different uh, outcomes. So one is valid, so the data that they receive from uh, the peer is, uh, is correct. And the other is neutral, so the data is correct, but it's it's not new data. It's data you already have. And then the th third outcome is failure, so the data is either incomplete or it's it doesn't you know the hashes don't match uh, and it's it's false. So you have w these three outcomes. So for reputation, you only care about the first two. You care about the valid occurrences and the failure occurrences. And the algorithm itself is too hard to just describe with words because there's lots of equations. But basically what happens is your node collects data about reputation, about these valid and failure interactions with other nodes. And then your node talks to each of your peers and it asks them for their data about the valid and failure interactions. And then, so it, it does this across everyone and uh, it just, does a power iteration and converges some trust scores based on this data from everyone. Because some people might lie, you have to you know, check and, and see if peer A is giving you the same type of data that peer B is giving you. So uh, it converges to a trust value. And this is used only for just kind of securing the peer-to-peer -peer network, well, just to make it more reliable. It's not required for actually securing the blockchain. It's just for helping to increase the, the usefulness of the peer-to-peer -peer data transfer. So in simulations, if you had 90% of the network uh, dishonest, so like giving you failed interactions, and they're always lying about other people, then Eigentrust++, plus plus, you only have 3.6% of the interactions are failing. So if 90% of the network is evil and lying to you, 96.4% of the interactions you have with nodes are correct because Eigentrust++ plus plus will block 
the uh, evil nodes. What's a harder case is when some of the dishonest nodes are honest some of the time. But even in that situation, when you have 90% of the network being malicious and they're giving you data, honest data 40% of the time and honest feedback 40% of the time, then even in that situation, you still have over 80% of the peer-to-peer -peer calls that are correct. So you're getting correct data from people. So it took a lot of effort to program, but it's it's not really a new algorithm. It already exists. And the uh, classical Eigentrust Plus algorithm, or the one that's in the paper, is actually a little bit more complicated than what we could do. So in Eigentrust Plus Plus, in a regular peer-to-peer -peer network, you can't verify that the data is correct or not. But uh, because we're using cryptography, we can actually verify the cryptographic hashes and to see if the data is correct. And so we can actually make the algorithm a little bit better than for generic network. Community-wise, uh, how far along are you guys? I, I noticed you started trading on Poloniex just this year. Are there any marketplaces open? Um, you know, what's the user base like? So uh, currently, it looks like there's maybe around 2,000 active users, I think, at least people that actively use or have NIM in their accounts that are at least off exchanges. It's hard to tell what people are doing on exchanges. Right now, the main only use really of NEM is speculation. And so people are really just speculators and they're, they're not really contributing too much to the uh, overall community. Some people are pretty good. So we have a Telegram chat group and Slack chat group and people are very active on there. And uh, it's a lot of fun actually. Really moving forward, we need to get past the speculators relying only on speculation and instead uh, actually build real uses. So towards that, there's actually several companies building on them. And one of them uh, just got funding from the community fund. So NEM set aside a, a fairly large amount, uh, kind of as a DAO in a way, where people can propose projects and get funding. And uh, this is called the NEM Community Fund. The first project just got an award from that, or just got accepted uh, by the community from that, and that's called C Crypto Apex. So it's exchange that's actually a legal company that's been registered, and that's going to work with converting between or kind of being a crypto exchange between fiat currencies and Zem and probably Bitcoin and some other currencies as well. So it's exciting to see some people uh, building companies on that. I'm also working on a international remittance service right now, and that's a uh, legal, legal company that's been registered as well. And we're hoping that will attract a lot of users. And then there's also some other projects. Uh, one is called Photomead, which um, is still being developed. It's kind of like a Instagram type of project, but instead you can also do some kind of buying and selling of uh, image rights. So to move past these speculators, we really need to have real users. And one thing that's very clear is that average people who are not crypto nerds, like I am, uh, they don't want crypto. They want uh, real money. So for example, uh, Japanese yen or, uh, or euros. And so what we need to do is we need to build services that people can just use without knowing that there's any kind of cryptography or, or NEM is even, uh, being involved in the, in the ideal case. I think a good analogy would be uh, NEM is the railroad tracks. NEM is really strong titanium, like wide gauge railroad track. And then on top of that, we need to build railroad cars that will then, you know, take people and take equipment and ship them around. Uh, that's the type of model that we're working on. Right now, we just have the, these, this awesome railroad, but we need to have uh, some good cars and, and engines on top of it to uh, make use of. Gotcha. Well, if anybody wants to get uh, involved with a project, what's the best place for them to go? That's a good question. So we have a uh, website, but it's, it's not too user friendly. It's called nem.io. The best place would be to probably go there at the beginning. And then uh, we're going to try to put some kind of way to for people to easily contact us on there. We also have a Facebook group. It's uh, www.facebook.com slash rnim. That's O-U-R-N-E-M. And you'll get good updates on there. And you can also get updates on Twitter, too. The Twitter is twitter.com slash nemofficial. Twitter is probably the best way to contact us uh, or contact me. right? And then just a preliminary contact and we can add people to Slack or, uh, or Telegram. Okay, great. Makoto, Jeff, Lon, thank you so much. And good luck with the new economy movement. Oh, thanks. Yes, thanks, Matthew. Yep, thanks. Thanks for listening to this episode of Let's Talk Bitcoin. Content for today's show comes courtesy of the New Economy Movement core development team and Matthew Zipkin. 
Music for today's episode was provided by Jared Rubens and The New Time. This episode was edited by Matthew Zipkin. Any questions or comments? Email adam at letstalkbitcoin.com.